Okay, let's have a look at the next worksheet. So the first question continues from the dynamics worksheet. Even though the engine continues to deliver a constant drive and force equal to your answer to be part one, the car eventually reaches a constant velocity of 28 meters per second. So the question now, what term is used to describe the maximum constant velocity reached by the car? And the answer is terminal velocity. Uh, next part, explain in terms of the forces acting on the car where the car reaches a maximum constant velocity. So what happens here is you have your car and it has a driving force here and the driving force causes an acceleration and an acceleration causes the velocity u to increase the v and this keeps happening as long as the force is being applied however at the same time there's friction acting against the driving force and this friction is directly related to how fast the car is going so the faster the car is going the more air friction there will be and the greater this force will be and this will continue to happen until it will cancel the driving force and the car will remain at a constant velocity no longer accelerating after that. So that's the reason. Um, so friction is proportional to velocity and friction will increase until the forces uh, balance each other out. So you just need to write a little sentence explaining that. Determine the work done by the engine if the car travels 8.4 kilometers. So the distance is 8.4 times 10 to the 3 meters at a constant velocity of 28. So it's 28 meters per second. Now we have some formulas for uh, work and for power. So for work we know the formula is force times distance uh, and for power we know it's force times velocity, which you don't actually need for the moment for this part here. So we know the distance, so if we knew the force, uh, we know how much work is being done. So let's see, just go back to the question now and see what information we had when we first did it. So this is the dynamics worksheet. So we had to calculate the driving force in B part 1. So let's try and get that answer back up for us. was the answers to dynamics maybe that was this one here so I got the answers up from earlier so the driving force was 2520 newtons so 2520 so let's go back now. So, 2520 was the driving force. So work equals 2520 multiplied by the distance, which we have. So let me make more space here.
work equals force times distance, which is 2520 multiplied by 8.4 times 10 to the 3. And that will equal calculator time. That's quite a large number now. 2, 1, 1, 6, 8, 0, 0, 0 joules. Or 2.1 times, let's see now, count that out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Jutes. Okay, so the next part is too big for us to write on the sheet. If the fuel of the car is able to release 32 megajoules per litre, determine the rate of fuel consumption in litres per second of the car as it travels at a constant 28 metres per second if the overall efficiency of the engine is 30%. So firstly now, and it's a formula which I haven't given you for efficiency but I said it before in class and uh, it's not too difficult to work it out yourself. So for example, if we have our light bulb here, and into the light bulb goes, let's say, um, 100 joules, maybe this is per second, and out from the light bulb, you get, say, two joules of light energy, and then the rest comes out as maybe heat, 98 joules of heat, then this light bulb is only giving you two joules of energy that you want for every hundred you put in. So you would think of this as being 2% efficient. So the formula to calculate efficiency, that's the symbol eta for efficiency, eta, efficiency will be um, the energy, like here too, that you get out, so the output uh, in the form that you want all over the input. So in this case it's 2 over 100 and just to make that a percentage multiply 100 percent. So that's the formula for efficiency. So you're told for the car that the efficiency is 32 percent. So that means you have 32 percent um, of the energy that goes in comes out in the form that you want. So 32% equals output over input multiplied by 100%. Now, the output energy Let's go back to our information here. This car, as it travels the uh, 8.4 kilometers, it used up a total of 2.1 times 10 to the 7 joules. Um, let's calculate how much energy is required per second for this car. So that's not uh, work per second or energy per second is the power. So power is force times velocity, which I said earlier. So that would be 2520 times velocity. So the power, 2520 times velocity, which is 28 meters per second. 
So let's calculate that. 2520 times 28. So that's 70560. watts. So per second the car requires or the car uh, delivers effectively 70,560 joules per second of useful output in the form of motion here. Uh, so how much power does the car require to extract or how much energy does the car require to extract from the petrol? Well, it'll be more than this because what's happening here, if I just draw it. So you have your fuel tank here. So for the car to drive forwards, does some work, does some power here. And the power we have is 70,560 watts. But we know from conservation of energy that this must come from somewhere. And in this case here, the power, the energy is taken from the fuel. So the fuel is used up to help the car go. But the car does not take 70,560 joules of energy per second from the fuel tank because the car is not 100% efficient. It needs to take more than that from the fuel tank and it will lose energy maybe in the form of heat and noise and other things like this. So we know what the output is. The output should be this. And we're looking for what the input is. Multiplied by 100% needs to equal 32%. Well, percent signs cancel there. A little bit of rearranging gives us 7056000 divided by 32. And that's how much power needs to go into the car so that it can have this as an output. So calculator tells us. That is 220500. So per second, the car needs 220,500 joules per second. Or in other words, it needs 2.2. .2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times 10 to the 5 watts going in. So we're not quite finished yet because we need to know how much liters it consumes per second. So we go back to the question now and we're told how much energy is in one liter. So the car has fuel such that one liter of fuel contains 32 megajoules. So one liter of fuel has 32 times 10 to the 6 joules in it. That's in one liter. So the car needs this much per second. So per second how much of a litre does it use up? Well, you can see here, this is less than, of course, this. So the car doesn't go through one litre per second. It goes through much less. How much of a litre per second does it require? Well, that'll just be a division. So we get 0 0.00, and if we round it off, 6875, so that would be 69. So per second, the car needs that much of a litre. So per second, 
car requires 6.9 times 10 to the minus 3 liters. Okay, let's have a look at the next question now. Calculate the kinetic energy of the cannonball as it strikes the ground. That continues from the kinematics question. So for this particular one here, we calculate the time of flight and we calculate the range. I need to calculate also uh, how fast it's going when it impacts the ground so we can calculate the kinetic energy. So we need to get up our answer from that. So I got the answer up from earlier. Uh, the time was 2.39 seconds. Okay, so what happened here? Particle was launched at 80 meters per second and then traveled like that until it hit the ground. What happens when it hits the ground? Well, when it hits the ground, it's still actually traveling horizontally with 80 meters per second. That never changes. But it would have gained some speed vertically. How much speed? Well, we can get that from our formula. Uh, v equals U plus AT. The U is zero, vertically speaking. So V just equals AT. Uh, T is 9.81. And T we got was... Two point three nine. So nine point eight one times two point three nine, and you get twenty three point four. Twenty three point four. So we want to calculate the combined velocity, so that would be square root 80 squared plus 23.4 squared. And then square root of that and you would get 83.4. 36 or we could say 83.4 83.4 meters per second so that's how fast it's going when it hits the ground so kinetic energy our formula is a half m v squared now what's the m here write it down in the answer. I didn't. I'll have to get it back up from the question. Six point four kg. So that would be a half of six point four, which is three point two times that squared so the final answer works out to be 22239 
two, two, three, nine joules. Describe and explain how the kinetic energy of the cannonball would be different from your answer if air resistance has a significant effect. Well, if there's air resistance, that implies that the cannonball will move slower. And if it's moving slower, then there'll be less kinetic energy. So the velocity when there's air will be less than the velocity if there's no air friction. And then that would mean the kinetic energy when there's air will be less than the kinetic energy when there's no air, which we got earlier. What's happening is the kinetic energy is robbed and given to uh, heat energy in the form of the friction. Question three. So we have here a bullet of mass 0 0.01 traveling at a velocity of 200 strikes a block of mass 0 0.39 and we have some questions to answer what happens this swings up and comes to rest here so 0 meters per second uh, state the principle of conservation momentum so that is the momentum at the beginning will equal the momentum at the end uh, it's closed with respect to force so if we have some system here and there's no force on the outside acting in we just have our particles inside and they're free to travel around bounce off walls maybe and um, there's no external force acting then the momentum at the beginning in total will equal the momentum at the end in total. Calculate the momentum of the bullet before it strikes the wooden block. So the momentum before it strikes the wooden block. Well, momentum is mass times velocity. So in this case, it would be 0 0.01 times 200. Which would equal 2. And what's the unit? Well, it'll be kg ms. That answers the first part quick enough. The velocity of the block immediately after the bullet has become stuck in it. So this starts off with 200, and this starts at rest, and then later they come together as 1, and it has some velocity v, we don't know and the bullet stuck inside. We do know why the bullet is traveling from here and becoming embedded in the block. There's no external force acting on the system or nothing significant. So we can say that the momentum at the beginning, which in this case is two, will equal the momentum afterwards, which in this case would be mass times velocity. The mass here is of the bullet and the block. So the bullet is 0 0.01 and the block is 0 0.39 so together that's 0 0.4 is the mass times the velocity v which we don't know and which we're looking for so we get this rather simple formula to calculate v v will just equal 2 divided by 0 0.4 which will work out as 5 so I get v equals 5 meters per second and here the momentum equals 2 kilogram meters per second. During the collision, kinetic energy from the bullet is transferred to the block. Determine the kinetic energy of the bullet just before it strikes the block. Well, that'll be a half m v squared. A half times m times v squared so 400 squared times 0 0.01 times 0 0.5 that actually works out to be 800 so the kinetic energy just before impact is 800 joules determine the kinetic energy of the combined block and bullet immediately after the bullet has become stuck in the block 
So that would, again would be a half m, in this case 0 0.4, and then v squared, uh, which we got be 5 squared, which is 25. So 25 times 0 0.4 times 0 0.5, that looks like to be 5 maybe. That'll be five. Five joules. State the reason whether the collision between the bullet and the block is elastic or inelastic. It'll be inelastic. Inelastic collisions is when there's a loss in kinetic energy. So for example, actually the, I suppose the word perfect might be missing here. So if you have object here and has velocity v and comes into the wall, bounces and comes back, and it's still traveling at v, well, there's no loss in kinetic energy. Same happens if you have two objects and they collide and then move off together, and you see that in total there's no change in kinetic energy, well, you say the collision is elastic. If there's a loss in kinetic energy, perhaps true heat or something like this then you say it's inelastic so it's inelastic here and the reason is the kinetic energy after the collision is less than the kinetic energy before the collision and last part now is calculate the height to which the center of gravity of the block will rise so what will happen here is at the beginning of when it starts to swing, when the bullet is inside the block, it will have an energy of five joules. Later, when it reaches its maximum height, it should still have an energy of five joules. But up here, it's at rest. So the energy must be in the form of uh, potential energy, which is mgh. So we get five equals 0 0.4 times 9.81 times h. So we can calculate h, no problem here. 5 divided by 0 0.4 divided by 9.81 and we get h is 1.27 meters. A large box of mass 20 kg is pushed a distance 5 meters up a rough slope at a constant velocity by a force of 80 newtons. The slope makes an angle 15, all shown here on the diagram. Determine the amount of work done in pushing the block up the 5 meters. Very straightforward again. Work is force times distance, which is 80 times 5, which I believe is 400 joules. Determine the gain in gravitational potential energy. So if I take this as ground level, then the gain in potential energy, or in other words the potential energy here, that would just be m times g times the height. So all I need to do is find the height here. Uh, that's not really a problem because you have the hypotenuse is 50 and you have the angle here is 15. So the height will be 15 sine. So we have height is found. It'll be 5 times sine of 15. So we can calculate the potential energy from that formula. 15 sine times 5 times 9.81 times 20. That would be equal to 254 joules. Determine the magnitude of the frictional force acting on the box as it's pushed up the slope. Now we're looking for keywords here. It's moving at constant velocity. So that means the force acting up must cancel the force acting down because it's not accelerating. So if we look at the block here, we have the downward weight here, which can be broken up into this component and into this component. So maybe I'll actually draw that. 
slightly bigger. So there's our block and it has weight of 20 G and that can be split into two parts here. If that's 15 degrees, if we make the triangle here, then that one there, uh, that would be 65. Yes, that's right, that's 65. So then this one here would have to be 15 as well. If I draw that again. So you have the weight act in here of 20 G, that's 15. That can be broken up into this piece and into this piece. That's 15, that's 65 and that's 65 and that there's 15. So this is the cost side and then this here is the same length as this. So that's the sign. So here is 15, so, sorry. The hypotenuse is 20G, so it's 20G sine 15. Acting upwards is 80 newtons. And weight is acting down this way. And then there's also the friction force here. And this must equal this, so we get... 20g sine 15 plus the friction force must equal 80 newtons. So friction force will be 80 newtons minus 20g sine 15. So let's calculate that. 15 sine of times g times Twenty. Take that from the eighty, and it looks like I get twenty nine point two. So the friction force is twenty nine point two newtons. Okay, last question now. A large loaded passenger jet aircraft has mass of 400 tons and is waiting at rest on a runway. All engines are running and provide a total forward force of 600 kilonewtons. Calculate the initial acceleration of the aircraft when the brakes are applied. So you have F equals MA. So 600,000 newtons will equal 4 well, let's use our notation properly. F equals MA. So F is 6 times 10 to the 5. That equals M, which is 4 times 10 to the 5 also, times A. They cancel. So 6 over 4, 3 over 2. So A is 1.5 meters per second squared. Give a reason why this initial rate of acceleration cannot be maintained because as the plane moves it will feel an increase in friction, air friction in particular, therefore reducing the net force. Shortly after takeoff, the aircraft climbs on a straight line path of slope 10 degrees to the horizontal at a constant speed of 75 as shown in the diagram. So the plane takes off and climbs at 10 degrees to the horizontal 
a constant speed of 75 meters per second as shown in the diagram. Calculate the vertical height gain per second. So if that's 10 and that's 75, well this would be 75 sine 10. Let's calculate that. And that would be 13.02. meters per second so per second it gains a height an altitude of 13 meters show that the gain in gravitational potential energy per second is approximately 51 megawatts so per second it gains 13 meters in height so the potential energy is mgh so in this case would be 4 times 10 to the 5 kg times g times h so per second that's how much potential energy it gains which will work out as yeah 5.1 times 10 to the 6 joules of potential energy is gained per second i.e. that's watts Given that the engines are working at a total power of 54.5 megawatts, calculate the total frictional force acting on the aircraft. So let's open this up. So what's happening now in the last part? Well, you have your aircraft. It has its weight. Its weight can be broken up into two parts. The engine is also trying to send it up to the sky here. And then you also have some friction force here. We don't know the friction force, I'll call it F. Uh, we know that this angle here will be 10 degrees. We can try and look at the diagram to see why. If the weight is acting down here, then this can be broken up into two parts like this. If this is 10 degrees, then this is 80 degrees, and this here is 10 degrees. So this here is actually 80. So the 10 is actually here, the 80 is actually here. So this one here will be the weight times cos 80. The weight is 4 times 10 to the 5 times cos 80. And the power here, or the force, we don't know what that is, but we do know that power equals uh, force times velocity. And we know what the power is, 54.5 megawatts. And we know the velocity is 75, so we have everything now. 54.5 times 10 to the 6 watts is the power, but that's the equal force times velocity. So if I just divide by the velocity, which is 75, that will give us the force. So let's calculate that. So that will be force will equal 0 0.726 times 10 to the 6. I'll just leave it like that for the moment. Actually, 0 0.727 times 10 to the 6. So that's it. Since it's traveling at constant velocity, it's not accelerating, and so the forces cancel. So I have 0 0.727 times 10 to the 6. That must equal 4 times 10 to the 5 cos 80 plus F. So cos 80 
class 80 now. So I get 0 0.727 times 10 to the 6 minus 0 0.695 times 10 to the 5 is to equal F. So I get 0 0.727 times 10 to the 6 minus, now I'd like to write this as 10 to the 6, so that'd be 0 0.0. 695 times 10 to the 6, that equals F. So 0 0.7, 0 0.727 minus 0 0.0695 times 10 to the 6 now. So I get force equals three two zero zero newtons. So that is the value of the friction force here.